In a recent video, I briefly mentioned going to a Jesus boot camp when I was attending a Christian college. If you missed that one, you might want to refer to it to make more sense of this video. Quick history, I grew up being indoctrinated into the Pentecostal Christian religion, and I also attended Lutheran school. I didn't really know anything about the outside world. I was like Bryce Dallas Howard in M. Night Shyamalan's The Village before she got out. I wasn't allowed to have any non-Christian friends or watch any non-Christian media, TVs, music, movies. Fast forward to me when I just turned 18. I thought my only option career-wise, that's cute, career-wise, was to work in a church or to become a missionary. Quite a few of my friends from church were also going to this Bible college in Griffin, Georgia to attend, get ready for it, Master's School of Ministry. No joke. It kind of sounds like something from Harry Potter. Master's School of Magic. Anyway, it's now called Segu Valor or Sagu Valor. After watching this video, if you're curious to know more about them or if you have any questions for them, direct link is below. There was this peer pressure to go to school, and I did. In the first few days of being at this school that was also in a church, the church is called Griffin First, and we were told to sign a waiver or an agreement to give them our permission to go to this rigorous boot camp. Think of it as the Bible college hazing experience, if you will. All of the students, there were 35 of us, including me, were told we were going to be taken to a secluded location and we would go into this boot camp. We would not be told where we were going to be taken to or for how long we would be there. We also had no idea what we would be doing at this camp, but the pastors made it sound so fun. Here were the rules when attending. One, you're not allowed to ask questions and you're not allowed to speak. Footnote, I would actually like to go to one of those silent meditation places at some point in my life, but that is definitely not what I'm talking about here. Two, we're not allowed to bring cell phones or watches because the pastors didn't want us to know what time it was throughout the whole camp experience. Three, we're only allowed to bring one personal item. Now this could be toothpaste, but it doesn't include your toothbrush. It could be a hair tie. It could be a roll of toilet paper and us students actually planned who was going to bring what to the camp. So we had supplies of what we needed. Also, women were told feminine products were excluded from this rule. So bring all the tampons and pads you want. I'm actually surprised they let women attend the camp, given our menstrual cycle impurities and uncleanliness. Like in Leviticus chapter 15, verse 19, when a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days. Seven days? and anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean. Anything she sits on will be unclean. Whoever touches her bed must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. In addition to this personal item rule, we were required to bring a backpack that had to have a duct-taped bag of sugar in it. The first years were required to buy a five pound bag of sugar, the second years a 10 pound bag of sugar, the third years 15 pounds of sugar, and there was no fourth year. This was a three year program because apparently that's how long it takes to still not understand the nonsense in the Bible. We later found out that the bag of sugar represented Jesus carrying the weight of the world's sins. The fourth rule, we had to follow their orders. I know, this all sounds great and appealing, right? No, 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 no! Quickly, before I get into the camp experience, I have to tell you about a night leading up to it. All of us students were with the pastors in the sanctuary, and the building was freezing. I remember seeing my friends physically, like, shaking because it was so cold. We were having an intense worship service, speaking in tongues, raising our arms, jumping around. It was like a Benny Hinn crusade. Let the bodies hit the floor, let the bodies hit the... The pastors were also telling us horror stories of missionaries who were tortured and killed for their faith. And the pastors told us, you have to be willing to do that too. Now, back to our camp experience or experimental prison. It happened late one night around 11.30. I remember waking up to the sounds of loud banging on the dorm rooms and my roommate was already up and frantically running around the room and she was screaming, this is it, this is it, we have to go, this is it. So I'm panicking because I didn't have my bag of sugar duct taped yet. I wasn't prepared. So I jump out of my bed, locate the duct tape and the sugar, and I sit on the floor and I'm rocking back and forth and I am just rapping and I look like a maniac just rapping this bag of sugar. My roommate leaves and the door is just swinging open. I throw on some shorts, a t-shirt, my tennis shoes, and I head out. We were later told that being taken suddenly was because when Jesus comes back, you're not gonna know. It'll just happen. 
So you have to be ready. I was totes not ready for the rapture. As I head downstairs to the front lawn, so many students were already there. The pastors were screaming at them to do jumping jacks and burpees, and we weren't allowed to stop until they said so. And this entire time, we're not allowed to take our backpacks off. So the entire camp experience, that backpack with sugar, is now a part of your body. As I joined my fellow students, I realized I had been holding them up. We were forced to work out until every student was gathered in the front lawn. Once everyone was finally there we were loaded onto a bus and we were told we were not allowed to fall asleep. Anytime a student would fall asleep or would start to fall asleep, the pastors would start screaming right in their faces and they would bang on the bus windows. They also would shine their flashlights in our faces. Meanwhile, my eyes are locked on the outside world. I remember trying to figure out if I could remember our direction or our course and I was also counting in my head. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three. I was counting in my head trying to figure out how long we were on the bus. Next thing I know, we pull to a stop in the woods. This secluded camp lodging area, no one else was there besides our group. As soon as we got off the bus, we were told to form two lines and start jogging. The camp area had trails and we were running on uneven terrain. I'm not sure how long we ran, I just remember feeling like I couldn't keep going. I looked over at my best friend at the time. I remember her crying. She was crying and just saying, I can't keep going, I can't keep doing this and the pastors would just get right in her face and screaming at her that she had to. I started slowing down also and they got right in my face and started screaming at me to keep going. Let me just take a second to say that that alone is not a pleasant experience. I don't think anyone likes to be yelled at. I don't think anyone likes to be forced to go beyond their athletic abilities. On top of all this, I grew up being sexually abused from the time I was four or five to 10 years old. And even at 18 years old, Having a man be that close to me made me extremely nervous and I found it to be threatening. What's gonna happen next? Oh God, what, what, what do I do? What, what's gonna happen next? Now imagine grown men surrounding you and they're screaming right in your face. I would do anything to get them to stop, so I ran. Afterwards, we were taken to our bunks. Men were in one room, women were in the other room. The pastors also checked our backpacks and then we were told to meet them at 3 a.m. the following morning or by this point later that day, who fucking knows? Since we didn't have watches or cell phones, we tried to take turns sleeping, but I don't think anyone fell asleep. How, how could you? You're in this intense environment. It's late at night already, and you know you're gonna be up right away anyway. You don't know what's gonna happen next. How could anyone fall asleep in that environment? When we thought, uh, it must be about 3 a.m. now, we gathered outside and we stood in our uniform two rows and we waited and waited and waited. Eventually, some of us sat down. Some students were too afraid to. When the pastors finally showed up, we started jogging again. We were later told they ran us straight for 24 hours. The only time we took short breaks was when the pastors played strange mind games on us. For example, Something that took place is us all standing in a circle and we were given two minutes to memorize everyone's name. They gave me three tries to do this and each time I couldn't do it, we were forced to do more workouts and exercises. After I couldn't do it, they moved on to someone else and then someone else. Eventually someone did it. Again, this was like the second week we were there. There are 35 of us and we're just now like getting to know each other. Another example, one night, again, we were standing in a circle and we were told we were not allowed to move. We were not allowed to take our feet off the ground, shift our feet in our shoes, don't even raise your toes. Our feet were planted and they had to stay that way. If you were caught moving your feet at all, you were forced to go do more workouts. After a few hours, people started to step out of the circle. The last woman standing nine or 10 hours later, she said, Jesus died on the cross for me. No matter how bad my feet hurt, no matter how much my feet ached, I had to stand. This was the least I could do, stand for Jesus. Another night after a full day of running and exercise, we were taken to a room that had a large TV in the corner and all over the floor there were like scattered pillows, there was also a couch, and the pastors told us to take a seat, you could lie down if you wanted to, and watch this old documentary film. They told us we could not fall asleep and then they turned off the lights. When someone started to fall asleep, we were all gathered outside and told to run up and down a hill. 
and we weren't allowed to stop until the pastor said so. This repeatedly happened, I think, three or four times. We were inside with the lights out, watching this old, boring documentary film, starting to fall asleep, then being jolted awake by pastors screaming in our faces, and then going outside and running up and down the hill again. I also remember the pastors treating this whole experience like a joke. The only food we were given to eat was this unflavored, gloopy oatmeal, and they loved giving me the biggest plate. You also had to eat every single bite on your plate. The longer it took you to do so, the more your friends outside, who already ate the food, were forced to run and exercise. They, again, were being held up. The pastor's reasons for doing this, they said, if you're a missionary and you're in a foreign country, and if people give you food, you have to eat it, regardless if you like it or not, and it would be highly disrespectful to not eat every single bite. We were at the camp for three days. When we got back to the church, I called my parents and I told them what happened, and I told them that I needed to leave. My parents reassured me that everything was okay. I had moved out of state for college and that this transition was going to be difficult and I just needed to give it more time. Then I went to the Christian counselor at this church and I told her I was extremely anxious and depressed and that I needed to leave. She said, don't listen to Satan because he was obviously putting these thoughts in my head. She said, don't listen to the devil and his demons. Listen to God. I had no one to turn to. No one took me seriously. Now I'm staying at this Bible college involuntarily and no one is letting me leave. So I decided to pull a Hamlet. I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. I felt as if I had been backed up into a corner and the only people surrounding me didn't or couldn't see that I needed help. I was completely surrounded by religious lunatics. If I wanted to get out, I had to do something extreme because they were extreme. I had to match their intensity level so they could finally see I needed to get the fuck out. I packed a small knife in my backpack and I went to morning prayer at the chapel. Each morning we had prayer that lasted for two hours. It started at seven and ended at 9 a.m. And you could go anywhere in the sanctuary space as long as you didn't fall asleep. Apparently radical Christians don't sleep. So I went closer to the stage area, the front of the room. I was hoping someone would see me and would stop me from what I was about to do and started doing. I began cutting my forearm, and I kept cutting, and no one saw me do that. I carved the words love me into my left arm. Unfortunately, you can still see the scars. If you saw me in person, you would be able to spot out my scars without having to stare. I don't want to show my scars in this video because I feel like that would be glorifying self-harm in a way, and I do not support that idea at all. I'm not proud of this. So I pushed my sleeve back over my arm and I just let that experience sink in for a day. And then I went to the pastors and I asked if I could speak with them privately and I showed them my scars. They decided to move me into another dorm room with an older student so she could keep an eye on me. That wasn't good enough for me. During this time, I had been talking to the Christian counselor and I had told her I didn't want to live anymore. I told her I needed to leave and if I couldn't, I was either going to drown myself, slip my wrists, or my other idea, which was running headfirst into this giant tiled wall that was in the chapel's bathroom. <sighs> so one Sunday morning, I'm having a panic attack and I tell one of the pastors, I was going to kill myself. And he told me to wait right there because he was going to go get help. So as soon as he turns, I ran. I didn't know where I was going and I didn't have a plan at that point. There's this big pond outside of the church. And that's where I found out later, the Christian counselor had told the people looking for me, check the pond, she's probably in the pond. Meanwhile, I ended up going to the women's bathroom and I just locked myself in a stall and I just cried. One of my friends found me and I was taken to the ER and then I was taken to a suicide hospital. And I stayed there for a few days and I remember calling my parents and pleading with them to come get me, and they did. Later, I was told that two other students also left the school just right after I did. I was also told that the pastors were really hard on the other students to not leave. My friend told me on the phone, they said, no one else is leaving, like screaming, no one else is leaving. And this is proof that religion can be dangerous. I'm fortunate that the religion 
I left was Christianity. The most I've lost from realizing I'm an atheist and being outspoken about that is friendships and relationships. I feel so much toward people who leave their religion. People in other religions where just them leaving and becoming an atheist has devastating results that are very extreme. That's horrible. People being treated so poorly just by rejecting a belief. And I want to talk about this more. Specifically, also how religion affects women. To be continued.